Uh, this is chapter 12 on the shear strength of soil. And today's lecture is part one of this chapter. So I divided this chapter into three parts. And first, if you look at the list of course objectives, this chapter touches on a number of main course objectives. So yeah, that includes determining the normal and shear stresses at a point in the soil mass and determine shear strength parameters and also the more coolant failure criteria. Before I talk about the concept of shear strength of soil, uh, so I want to briefly discuss this uh, event. This is a catastrophic landslide that happened back in 2014 in Washington state. So many of you probably know this uh, event. And so this event caused uh, significant damages and casualties. And so what triggered this landslide is many other landslides around the globe is actually heavy rainfalls. So this is the landslide location and there are a number of weather stations around this landslide location. I have put up the precipitation, uh, precipitation data here for these uh, weather stations. So I want you to focus on just the last row here. So this last row. So this is basically the data about a month and a half before that landslide happened. And for each weather station, I listed two rows of data. Okay. So the first row here, so this is the precipita precipitation data in 2014. So that's basically when the landslide happened. And then the second row for that station, this is the long-term average, so it's norms. Okay. And if you look at all these weather stations, you realize that in 2014, before that landslide happened, the uh, precipitation is about 150 to 200% of that uh, long-term average. Okay. So that rainfall, heavy rainfall triggered that landslide. And this is true for most of the landslides happened around the globe. And there are two main reasons. So the first reason is when you have this heavy rainfall, the rain basically penetrates and saturates the surface soil. And that saturation of surface soil increases the pore pressure and decreases the effective stress. So that basically means you have less resistance. And second, and we'll have heavy rainfall that seepage force adds to the driving force. Okay, so your driving force increases, resistance decreases. So that's why landslides typically happen after heavy rainfalls. And so in this uh, failure, when, when slope fails, basically that's when the shear stress in the soil reaches its ultimate state, and that's when the slope fails. Okay. That relates to what we're going to discuss in this chapter. That's basically the shear strength. Okay. So shear strength, so we measure the resistance of soil to failure in terms of its shear strength. And so I focus on shear strength here because in most geotechnical engineering problems, soils fail because of the excessive applied shear stress. Okay. And shear stress or strength it is basically the shear stress of soil at failure. Okay. Shear stress of soil at failure. In this shear strength definition, there are actually two terms I want to highlight. One is the shear stress, and the other one is failure. So shear stress, so basically to determine the shear strength, we need to know the stress state in the soil. Okay, so that's basically part one of this chapter. We're going to talk about how can you determine the shear stress in the soil. And then the second term here, failure, is how do you define failure? What criterion do you use to, to define failure? So that's basically uh, the more coolant failure criteria. So we'll discuss more on that. And this shear strength is basically the ultimate uh, or maximum shear stress the soil can withstand before it fails. Okay. And shear strength is actually a very important concept in geotechnical engineering because it affects many engineering applications in bearing capacity, slope stability, returning wall design, even pavement design, you need to know the shear strength of soil So in these applications. As I mentioned for this chapter, I divided into three parts, basically. So part one of this chapter, so we're going to focus on one, this concept of more circle of stress, which helps us to determine the stress in the soil mass. So that relates to the first part of the shear strength definition. And two, this more coolant failure criterion basically tells us when soil fails. Okay. 
And part two and three of this chapter deal with mostly the shear strength parameters. So for today, we're going to actually focus on this first concept here. To introduce this more circle of stress, uh, let's look at the soil element here, this part A here. So this uh, small soil element is subjected to a combination of normal and shear stresses. So we have these vertical and horizontal normal stresses, and then all these are shear stresses, tau x, y are shear stresses. And if you know the normal and shear stresses on these two planes, then you can find the normal and shear stresses on any plane. Okay. So, so tangential, this is basically shear stress. Okay, so this is the normal stress sigma n, and this is tau n shear stress on any plane we call theta. So theta is at the angle from the horizontal direction. So this plane is at angle theta from horizontal direction. And the way to def basically derive tau and sigma on this plane is to use uh, force balance. So basically some force in the horizontal and some forces in the vertical direction use equilibrium you can solve for these two stresses. Okay. So this is basically equation 10.3 and four. So tau, sigma n and tau n. So this is normal stress and shear stress. A uh, couple of things I want to point out when you want to use this equation. First, this angle theta. First, the theta is from horizontal direction. So that's very important. Okay. And second is the signs of these stresses. Okay. And we'll talk about sign conventions in just a minute. So these sign conventions, sigma x, sigma y, and tau x, y. So if you're plugging in sigma x, y, and uh, tau x, y into these two expressions, you want to make sure you the stresses on your soil element match what's shown here. If it's not, you have to add reverse sign. Okay. So we, uh, we actually have one example. So I'll go over one example on that. Okay. So just pay attention to these two things. One is the definition of theta. What's that theta measure? measuring and then the signs of these stresses. If you look at this uh, last equation here, this shear stress, okay, there is a special plane where if tau n equals to zero, okay, so if you set tau n equals to zero, you can solve for the normal stress on that plane. And this is called the principal planes. Okay. Principal planes basically are the planes where shear stress on that plane is zero. Okay. And you can find the angle of this principal plane by setting tau n equals to zero in that previous equation. So you can find the direction of this plane where that shear stress is zero. And this plane is called principal plane. And then the normal stress on that plane is called principal stress. So principal stresses are the normal stresses acting on the principal plane. Okay. So that's basically the corresponding sigma n. Uh, that's the normal stress. And for each soil element, there are two principal stresses. One is called major principal stress, sigma one. And the other one is minor principal stress, sigma three. Okay. And these two planes are perpendicular to each other. So for each soil element, you have two principal planes and two principal stresses. Okay. So one, the larger one is called major and the smaller one is called major principal, uh, minor principal stress. So that's principal plane and principal stresses. And so if you look at, let me go back one slide. For these two equations, sigma n and tau n, there's a special case. So if your soil element is subjected to a combination of principal stresses, so sigma one and sigma three, 
you can calculate the normal and shear stress on any plane using these two principal stresses. So if you want to find sigma n, so let me use the same convention here. Okay. If you want to find the normal and shear stresses on any plane theta, you can use equations 10.8 and 10.9. Okay. So these two equations make use of principal stresses, sigma one and sigma three. Okay. So that's basically a special case of the previous two equations. Okay. And again, when you use this, make sure one, you know what theta value, what theta represents. Okay. So that's the angle from horizontal direction. And two, the signs of these principal stresses. So that's a special case. And then if you, so if you start from uh, these two equations, 10.3 and 10.4, you can actually derive this following relationship between these sigma xy and tau xy. Okay. And this equation is basically an equation of a circle. And this is called the Mohr circle. So this Mohr circle of stress, the equation for that circle is given on this side. And you can derive the center of the Mohr circle. And then also the radius of the Mohr circle in terms of the horizontal vertical stresses, sigma x, sigma y, and the shear stress tau xy. Okay. In, in terms of how do you construct a Mohr circle, and there are two scenarios facing. The first one is you know the stresses on two orthogonal planes. Okay. The case is shown here. So you have this soil element, okay. and you know the normal, so that's sigma x, sigma y and also the shear stress tau xy, tau xy on these two orthogonal planes. That gives you basically two points on the Mohr circle. And then you can construct the Mohr circle using these two points. Okay. So this M, so this basically represents the normal and the shear stress on the horizontal plane, on this plane here. So this is a horizontal plane. And point N, this is the normal and shear stress on that vertical plane, it's this point. So these two planes are orthogonal to each other. So they're perpendicular to each other. And on the Mohr circle, if you're connecting these two points on two orthogonal planes, that line is going to pass the center. So that's one way you can construct this Mohr circle by knowing the stresses on two orthogonal planes. And the second is uh, if you know principal stresses and sigma one is major, sigma three is minor. Okay. And sigma one, so this is the horizontal plane in this case. On this horizontal plane, what's implicitly stated here is the stress is basically sigma one and zero, okay. because it's principal plane. So the shear stress value is zero. And then on the Mohr circle, zero shear stress plus on the horizontal axis. So that's your normal stress. And tau is shear stress. On the vertical plane, your stress is sigma three and shear stress is zero. Okay. So that's this point here. So this is the, sh the vertical plane. So this point, sigma three zero represents the normal and shear stress on that vertical plane. So this is sigma three zero. Okay. So that's another way you can construct a more circle if you know the two principal stresses. Okay, see? So basically you know the intersection, the two intersections of Mohr circle with uh, with the horizontal axis, then you can construct this Mohr circle. Okay. 
So then let's talk about the sign convention for soil mechanics. So for normal stress, compressive or compression is regarded as positive. And we treat tension as negative. Okay. So this is opposite to continuum mechanics convention. Okay. And shear stresses, they are positive if they tend to pro produce a counterclockwise rotation. So I've listed two soil elements here. So let's look at the signs of these force, these stresses. Okay. So first uh, for normal stress, for this top one here, this is a compressive normal force on the horizontal plane. So by spiral sign convention, that's positive. And for the vertical plane, again, these are compressive force or compressive stress. So it's positive. And then for the bottom soil element here, we have a tension on the ver uh, horizontal surface, horizontal plane. So that's negative by our sun convention. And then for vertical plane, we have compressive force positive. So that's the normal stress sign convention. And then let's look at the shear stresses on these two soil elements. Okay. So for the top one here, um, for let's focus on this one here. So this shear stress, it produces a counterclockwise rotation. Okay. So if you imagine you're applying this shear stress, it's going to rotate this soil element in a counterclockwise fashion. So that by our sign convention, positive shear stress. And same for this shear stress at the bottom. Again, that tends to rotate your soil element in a counterclockwise way. So that's a positive shear stress. And then for these two vertical planes, if you look at this element here, this uh, shear stress here, so this shear stress tends to rotate your soil element clockwise. Okay. So that by our sign convention is negative shear stress. And same for the other shear stress on the vertical plane. Okay. So it tends to rotate your soil element clockwise. So that's a negative shear stress. And then for the bottom one here, again, we have two pairs of shear stresses. For the top one, this one turns to rotate the soil element clockwise. So that's a negative shear stress. And the bottom one, again, they come in pairs. So this is also negative. And then for the two vertical planes, this shear stress on the vertical plane, so this turns to, tends to rotate the soil element counterclockwise. So that's positive shear stress. And same on the other side, positive. Okay, so that's our sign convention for normal and shear stresses. So this more circle stress, it represents the state of stress at the point. So we have seen that each point on the more circle basically corresponds to a pair of normal and shear stress on a particular plane. And so next topic is basically to find the normal and shear stress on any plane. So, so far I have introduced two sets of equations that equation 10.3 and 10.4 and 10.8 and 10.9. So these two sets of equations can be used to calculate the normal and shear stress on any plane. For today's lecture, I actually want to focus on this third method here. And this is used in geotechnical engineering. It's called the pole method. And this is a graphical method to determine normal and shear stresses. Okay. And more circle, of course, can be used to find principal stresses. And for any given more circle, 
the intersections with the normal stress or the horizontal axis are the principal stresses. Okay, so this is major. So that's the larger one of the two principal stresses. And the smaller one of the two is the minor principal stress. So again, give any more circle, immediately you know these two stresses. So let's look at this pole method. So the pole method, as I mentioned, it's a graphical method. We're going to basically use the more circle and find and basically read the stress from the graph. Okay. And there are two main steps involved in this pole method. The first step is to locate the pole on the more circle. Okay. So you have to find that pole. And there's only one pole for every more circle. So that's unique. For a given more, a more circle, there's one unique pole. The first step is to basically locate that pole. And the second step is to use that pole to find stresses on any plane of interest. And for the first step, there are a few steps involved here to identify, to locate the pole. The first one is to identify a known point so no one point means you know the stresses and also you know the plane orientation. And then second step is draw a line from the known point on the more circle parallel to the plane on which that known stresses act. And then the intersection with more circle is a pole. Okay. And I'll, again, I'll go over a couple examples. It's much easier to understand with examples. And for second step, if you know the pole, you start from the pole, draw a line parallel to the plane of interest. And then the intersection of the line with the Morse circle gives the stresses on that plane. It's maybe hard to comprehend by just looking at these steps. So I prepared a couple of examples. You'll see it's, uh, it's actually pretty easy to use. And again, you read the values of the normal and shear stresses directly from the graph. That's why it's called a graphical method. So let's go over a couple of examples and this will help you understand this pole method. It's actually very easy to use. 